You guys may be seated this morning. Good morning, Cross Point. My name is Byron. I am one of the pastors here. I uh, get the honor and privilege of leading the youth ministry. And every once in a while, they let me out of the back to come hang out with the adults. So if you would, we are in a series currently called How to Grow, How We Grow. And so if you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be looking at another passage of how we grow. And my assignment this morning is to talk about prayer. So Matthew chapter 6 in your Bibles, and we'll be looking at prayer. We're going to start in verse 5. It says this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard with their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is God's word. Let's pray together one more time. Lord, we thank you that you have called us to pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we have in your word. Would you please give us understanding what it means to be a person of prayer, that we might grow and draw closer to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer is not specifically a Christian thing. It's a human thing. Let me explain. Many cultures, many traditions, many religions have different types of prayer. Now, the Jews pray three times a day. The Muslims pray five times a day. Buddhists pray. Hindus pray to their many gods. People pray in many different religions, in many different contexts. Even people who don't believe in God pray. In 2004, a study came out about prayer And this study asked a group of atheists if they have ever prayed, and over 30% admitted that sometimes they had prayed. Now, they admitted that mostly it's in terrible situations, in the foxhole, as we would say. That's when people pray. Now, if there are people around and if people are alive, they are praying. Why is this? Why is it that praying seems to be something everyone somehow, in some way, partakes in? Swiss theologian Karl Barth, he says it like this, it's our incurable God sickness. You and I, humanity at large, have this need to connect with the divine. And people have a desire, they long for, they want to be connected, something bigger than ourselves. Now, we all have some way or shape or form that we're connected to prayer. Even if you haven't been going to church for a long time, I'm sure you're familiar with the term prayer. But here's my experience as prayer as a kid. When I was a kid, prayer was quite vague for me. I loved the idea of it, but it was quite vague. I grew up in the Catholic Church, and I was very involved in the Catholic Church. I was an altar boy for a very long time, and had a great childhood growing up in the Catholic Church. But one thing I had to learn in order for, for me to participate in the services is there was time, there were some three things that I had to learn. Two of the things were creeds. Now, creeds are these little, small um, distillations of the Christian faith in a few sentences. We sing one here. I had to learn the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Now, we sing the Apostles' Creed here. One of the, cor- the chorus of it goes, I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. So it's a song we sing that tells us the truth about our Christian faith. One of the other things that I had to learn and memorize was what the Catholic Church calls the Our Father, and what we call in the Christian tradition, 
the Lord's Prayer. I had to learn this. Now, I learned it in the old King James. So it was our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That means I have extra credit brownie points in heaven. That's what that means. <laughs> now, it's absolutely essential as followers of Jesus that we would be a praying people. In order for us to grow as Christians, we have to be a praying people. To say it bluntly, without prayer, there is no growth that we can have as Christians. Here in our text, Jesus makes an assumption about prayer. Look with me in verse 5. Look at what he says here. He says, and when you pray. So Jesus, right off the bat, who's talking to a group of people in his sermon, he says, when you pray. Not if you pray. Not if you would like to pray, not when you come around to praying, when you pray. The assumption that Jesus has, because he knows humanity, is that people will pray. And when you pray, there's a certain way. The Bible says, like Pastor Bruce was saying last week, that in order for us to grow, we need to read the Bible. We need to know the scriptures. And the second way is we grow through prayer. Now, the Bible says reading, knowing, cherishing the scriptures is kind of like the way we eat food. In order for us to grow and to be nourished as people, we need to eat food. We need the nourishment of proteins, of carbs, of vegetables. We need to eat. Sometimes we even eat because we delight in it, because food is great and it's a gift from God. As you can tell, I'm one of the people who don't eat to live, but live to eat. You and I need food to survive. And the Bible says that the Word of God is kind of like food for our soul. In order for us to grow or survive as Christians, we need the Word of God. We need a constant diet of the Word of God. Literally, food keeps us alive. Scripture keeps us close, connected to God. Jesus says it like this, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Now, if consuming the Bible is like nourishment for our hungry souls, then prayer is like water. In order for us to survive, we need food and water. We need water and food. We cannot have one without the other. Eventually, we will die without either one of them. And same is, this, same is true with our Christian faith. We need the food of God's word and the water of prayer for us to live and thrive as human beings and as Christians, people pray, specifically Christians, to grow in their faith. Now, you might be asking the question now, what is prayer? Well, thank you so much for asking because I want to give you an answer for what prayer is. Now, I dug really deep. I looked at all my commentaries that I had. I, look at, I read a few resources. I looked through 2,000 years of church history. And this is the definition that I got for prayer. Are you ready? Prayer is talking to God. It's deep, right? Prayer is talking to God. Simply said, it's talking to God. In more detail, prayer is a personal seeking communication response and connection to God. It's a personal seeking communication response and connection to God. It is the way us humans connect to God the Father. Prayer is our gift given by God to communicate with Him. Now, I want to take a quick moment to give us some perspective. As the Bible tells us, before we were Christians, we were enemies with God. Like, it, the language isn't kind. It literally says we were in direct opposition to God before we were Christians. And because Jesus came and died on the cross to save us, and because we put our trust in him, he does that. Friends, if you're here and you've never heard the gospel for the first time, or if you're here and church is new to you, we want to invite you into this conversation that says you are enemies with God, but if you put your faith in Jesus, he will save you. And in so doing, the result of that is that not only are we saved, the Bible says God adopts us into his family. We become sons and daughters of God, not in a 
in a literal sense, we get to be the sons and daughters of God. So when we approach prayer, the way we approach prayer isn't that of us going to someone high and mighty like the president. It's us having the posture of a child talking to a father. It's a tender, it's a love, it's a connection between a child and a father. That means we have unlimited access to the Father because of what Jesus has done. We can always cry out to him. We can always call on his name. We can always communicate and enter into his presence to use the language of the Bible. Now, thinking about last week, James Montgomery Boyce says this, through the Bible, through Bible study, God speaks to us. By prayer, we speak to God. So do you see this language, this conversation that the Bible gives us? By Bible study, God speaks to us, and by prayer, we speak to God. Now, to go back to our text this morning, in the context, Jesus is in the middle of his famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And what he's doing here is he's addressing what life is like in the kingdom. How do you live as a Christian? How do you live in light of the gospel? He addresses things like marriage, anger. He addresses things like prayer, what we come to in this passage. He addresses things like how to live the blessed life. And he says there's actually a way not to pray. There's a way not to pray. Turn with me back to verse 5. And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Look with me at verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask of him. So what he says here is there is a way for you to connect with God. There is a way for you to pray. And it's not out in the open so that you can sound holier than other people. It's not in a way to, so that you can be seen as better than you are. But there is a way to connect with God. Like many things in our Christian faith, prayer is so important. Prayer is commanded to us in Scripture. Yet, it's a privilege of ours to seek God. Now, I want you to know this. Like the quote that we looked at earlier from Karl Barth. At the heart of prayer is connection. Did you know that? At the heart of prayer is connection because people need to be connected. Think of Genesis 1, chapter 2. God wanted to be with his people always because we need connection. At the heart of prayer is connection. Now, there's always a time for us to ask for God what we need and what we want. But he is not a cosmic vending machine. We can come to him, yes, with our desires and our cares and all of that. But if we come to God always just to try to get what we need rather than connection, we are in the wrong. Lord, a house for me on the beach here? Lord, a million dollars there? Lord, tuition paid for for all my children? I mean, you fill in the blank for what you're going through. But we don't approach God just for those things, but for connection. I learned this from my dad. My dad is the most generous person you'll ever meet. The most generous. He is so kind. He is thoughtful of people. He is just so generous. He is also the most task-oriented man I have ever met. I am not kidding with you. He has a little planner. Every moment down to the minute of every single day is accounted for. There's purpose, there's something that he's doing. It is awesome. But I am constantly calling him, probably ruining that schedule. (laughs) And guess what? There is never a moment where my dad does not want to take my call. He answers my call, and he even listens graciously to the endless amount of requests that I have for him and my mom. Mom, dad, can you take the dog out? Can you take the kids out? Can you help us with this? Can you come over for this? I mean, it seems like an endless amount of lists of the things that we ask him for, yet he still answers my call. Now, here's the thing. I know he's very task-oriented. I know that he has a lot going on. He's a busy man, as we are all busy. 
And every time we get through those conversations about, can we do this? Do you need to do this? How can I help you here? Can you help me out? It's always the same thing. You know what he asks? He says, how are you doing? What's going on? Tell me about your life. What he's doing there is he's trying to connect with someone he cares about deeply. He is showing me the heart of what a father is. And that is what God the Father does for us. Of course we can ask him for the endless amount of things. He, he provides according to the riches of his glory, the scripture says. He has so much to give and offer and we should be giving those things. But at the heart of it all is prayer. So, we now know what prayer is. We now know that God wants to connect with you and I as his sons or daughters. Now you may want to ask the question, how do we pray? Well, I'm glad you asked the question because I want to give you five reasons on why we should pray or how do we pray. How do we develop a prayer life in seeking the Father? Number one, if you're taking notes, we devote time to prayer. We devote time to prayer. Back to our text one more time, verse six. He says, but when you pray, this is Jesus speaking, when you pray, go into your room, Shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. I don't know if you see this, but the intentionality that gives us Jesus in this passage is that you go away, you close the door, you put away distraction, and you spend time with your Heavenly Father in prayer. How many of you guys have ever been on a date or out with a friend and you're going to get coffee or you're going to get lunch and all you are met with is someone else on the other side of the table on their phone. I would never do that because I'm a millennial, but (laughs) have you ever experienced that? We have all experienced that. Trying to connect with someone in that way is so difficult. And what Jesus has said here is there's this intentionality that you and I can have for God the Father, in our time with him. When you go, when you make the time to pray, go to your room and be with him. On a practical level, let me ask you this question. Do you ever schedule time to pray? In your daily life, is there a block of time, whether it be small or big, dedicated just to praying? If you're new to this Christian faith, we engage in prayer with our Heavenly Father. And it's kind of like a muscle for us to grow, to spend time in His presence. Maybe start with five minutes. Maybe start with 10 minutes. Maybe start with 15 minutes and work, work your way there. For reference, here's what my morning looks like. When I wake up, I usually go and exercise. And as soon as I'm done exercising, because I'm a little bit more awake and I have a cup of coffee to the glory of God, I sit at my desk and I open up my Bible. And when I open up my Bible, before I start reading, I pray usually a 30-second prayer. Lord, give me understanding. Help me understand what I'm going to read this morning. And then I get to reading my Bible plan. Right now, I'm reading through the Bible in a year. It's usually about four or five chapters a day. And then after that, I enter into my time of prayer. In the back of my Bible here, I have a list right down here where it says, my wife, my kids, My mom, my dad, my little brother, my church, the staff here at church, these are things that I pray for every single day, things that I seek the Lord about. And then after about 15 minutes, 20 minutes on a good day, 10 minutes on a bad day, I close up and I go about my day. Now what's interesting is, I can't seem to stress stress this enough, when life gets busy, when more responsibility gets added to us, When things start happening and our schedules get tight, you know what seems to be the first thing that goes is Bible reading and prayer. And it cannot be that way. Hear the priority of Jesus. He says, but when you go into your room, shut the door, make it a time where you go and pray. The second way we grow is we pray without ceasing. We pray without ceasing. Let me read you a verse from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul is talking to his young protege, Timothy, and he says this in verse 16, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. So have unending prayer. So what he's saying here is not that you stop all your life, that you quit your job, 
and you tell your boss, I can't actually work because I have to pray always without ceasing. It doesn't mean that you become a monk and seclude yourself in the room, and if that's something that you do, God bless you. But what it means is that all of our lives becomes a moment where we can pray with God. So we have that time where we spend with the Lord every day on our own, and then throughout the day seeking and asking the Lord for your help. We are always in his presence. He is before us. He is with us. And in every situation we find ourselves in, you and I can pray in every moment. You ever have a hard moment at work? You ever just dealing with something you can't figure out and you're like, what do I do here? Well, it's a moment to pray. Lord, help me in this moment. You ever have a time where you have a difficult boss or a coworker? I don't have that problem here because I work at church, thank God. But you know what I'm talking about, right? We have moments where we need the Lord. How about at home when your children, as cute as they are, are really frustrating and you're having a moment? My kids laugh at me, and I do this all the time. We'll be in the middle of something, something's going on, there's, and I just out loud, Lord, please help me because I'm losing my patience right now. Has that ever happened to you? And that's what we are called to do. Listen, at worst... I'm warning the kids that I'm losing my mind. At best, I'm inviting God into this moment <laughs> and saying, help us. A lot is going on. My 10-year-old is in the front row going. <laughs> my wife and I, as often as we can, but every evening we take a few moments to spend time together. Uh, it's a check-in. How are you doing? How was your day? How's it going? How, did you have a rough day? Did you have a good day? Great. And throughout the day, we're texting each other. How's it going? You need anything? Can I grab dinner on the way home? Whatever it is. And there's a constant trying to connect. Now, some of us, if I were to ask you, I only connected with my wife on date night. So if date night was Thursday, every, Thursday night every week, and I said, that was the only time we really connected. The rest of the time, we kind of stay away from each other. We have a lot going on. She's working. I'm working. You guys might say, that is a bad connection between you two. Now, some of you said, that sounds great. We have marriage counseling at the church. But <laughs> we would all say, that is not the way to connect with someone. You and I are called daily, especially with the people we're in close fellowship with, are called to connect without ceasing and spend devoted time to that. The same is true. Most importantly, it's true with the Lord. We have time with him every day, and without ceasing, we can turn to him. Number three, we pray for others. We pray for others. First Timothy chapter 2 says this, verse 1, for, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for all people. So Paul, again, talking to Timothy here, is saying, you are called to pray for people. Then he goes on in this list to say, you need to pray for people in authority, kings, rulers, but as good and godly people, the way we show that love of Christ is for praying for others. The way we grow in our faith is praying for others. It's a privilege to pray for others. You ever heard that statement, well, all I can do is pray for you? That's actually the incorrect statement. The best thing you can do is pray for a friend or a family member who needs prayer. Imagine this for one moment, okay? The God of the universe is at, is at hand, and you have a friend pleading for you for whatever it is you're going through. You see, it takes the attention off us and puts it on others. And every day we should be practicing this praying for others in our lives. Number four, we pray the scriptures. We pray the scriptures. Now, have you ever been through something that was really difficult and you just didn't have the language to express it? Do you know what I'm saying? You ever been something, and I just, I don't know what to say right now. I don't know how to help the situation. Well, the reason we pray the scriptures is because the scripture gives us the language we need when we don't have it. Let me read to you in Psalm 42. 
And there was one time, there's been a few times, but one time that I went through a really, really deep depression. I went through a really, really hard time, and I could not figure out why. It wasn't one of those things that happened, like I knew what was going on. I was just in a slump. I could not get out of it. And I even couldn't pray. And this is the language that the Lord gave me from his word. Psalm 42, verse 1 says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for living God. And then he asked the question, the same question I was asking. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? David's asking, why are you sad, soul? I mean, I was in a place in my life where I was married, had kids, was a pastor, was leading people. Everything was going great, yet I had this sadness I could not figure out. And the, question, the language of the Bible became my language. Byron, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Also, the language of the Bible got me out of it. Look at verse, the end of verse 5. It says, Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So when we don't have the language ourselves, we pray the scriptures. Not only that, we pray the scriptures so that we can Give back the promises that he gave to us to back to God. For instance, have you ever been scared or nervous? You ever had a presentation that you had to give in the office and you're like really nervous because you don't like to public speak? Has that ever happened? Something like that has happened? Well, Joshua 1.9 says, do not be afraid. Do not be, a courage, be courageous for I'm with you. The Lord is with you wherever you go. So this is what that moment looked like. Lord, right now in this moment, I'm about to go up and give this presentation and I'm really nervous. But your word says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous, says the Lord, for I am with you. We pray the scriptures. Not only that, in James chapter 4, verse 3, it says this, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. So James here is correcting the people he's writing to because they're asking God for things wrongly, they're asking God for things that they shouldn't be asking for. And he says, this is why your prayer is not answered. When we read the word of God, we then know the will of God. We can ask God correctly the things that we want and need. We should be praying the scriptures. And lastly, we pray with persistence. We pray with persistence. Two more places in your Bible. Matthew chapter 7 where Pastor Bruce read for us this morning, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. He says this, this is Jesus again speaking, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. Here, in the Greek, this is an active tense, the word ask, seek, and knock. So here's how this verse can be translated. And by the way, do you know how pa Pastor Bruce last week said we can read different translations and that will help us? Well, the NLT says it like this. It says, ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. What he's saying here is prayer is hard. It's hard to stay consistent in this one thing. But Stay persistent in it. Keep asking the Lord for help. Keep seeking the Lord for help. Keep knocking on the door for the Lord's help. We say consistent and persistent in prayer because in so doing, we connect with the heart of God and we ask him of what we need in our lives. We gave you a little acronym to make it a little bit helpful for you to remember how to pray. Now, if you are a person who are new to prayer, this is going to be really helpful. If you're someone who's been praying for a long time and you need some structure, hopefully this proves helpful for you also. The acronym is ACTS, and it stands for adoration. Number one, adoration. We take a moment to adore God, thank him for who he is. Maybe think about one of his attributes and ask him uh, to understand that part more of him and to thank him for that part of him. We then confess. We confess our sins. We confess the things that we need help in. Then we give thanks, thanksgiving. 
We thank him for all that he's done and what he's doing. And then the last thing is supplication. We pray for our needs and the needs of others. We're going to come back to this in a little bit. What I want to do, we're almost done, is give us some perspective about prayer. When we pray, we are connecting with our Heavenly Father. It's almost as if the heavens open up and we get to talk and be with our Heavenly Father. I want to read you an old hymn that gives us language about how good prayer is for us. This hymn is called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It says this, What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Isn't that so true? Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Psalm 16, last place in the Bible. You don't have to turn there, but I'll read it to you. David is speaking about what it means to be in the presence of the Lord. Now, we are always in the presence of the Lord, right? He's with us. He's with us right now. He's always with us. But there is a time where we actively seek God, like in times of prayer, like in times at church, where we notice the presence of the Lord. Look at what it says here in verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. When we are in the presence of the Lord, when we seek him, there is joy, there is connection, there is love. That incurable God sickness is made well. In closing, I want to read you something. This is a book that I really love and cherish. It kind of sits next to me on my shelf. I go back to it all the time. And it's a memoir of my favorite pastor, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And his wife wrote a book during the time they were at uh, the small church he was pastoring at. So he was a pastor of two different churches. One was a small country church. And the second one was what he's known for, big Westminster Chapel in England. And this is during the small days. And in their church, they had a Monday night prayer meeting. And I want to read you an interaction of a guy who loved to pray and who really realized that when he prayed, he was in the presence of the Lord. Here's what it says. The guy's name is Harry Wood. The doctor's name, they call him doctor because he was a medical MD before he became a pastor. It says this. A year or more after this, we were in the regular Monday night prayer meetings, and doctor had asked Harry Wood to open the meeting. The word came alive as he read, and then he prayed. He seemed to lead us to the very gates of heaven, and they kind of all fell upon us when Woods went to sit down. As we bowed our heads again for the prayer of others, we heard a strange whistling breathing. It got louder and louder, and then it stopped. And we raised our heads to see two strong men catch Harry as he fell. They carried him out of the vestry. The vestry. Doctor followed them as we sat frozen in our seats. When he came back, he told us that Harry Woods had gone to his eternal home in glory. None of us was surprised. He seemed to be there already as he prayed. That is the perspective you and I need to have when we pray, that we are in his presence. We are in God's presence. And if the Lord were to take us now, we would go from glory to glory. Amen? In closing, I want to do one quick thing. I want to model Acts for us. Here's what I mean. Acts, uh, A means adoration. So I am going to pray about the holiness of God and thank him for being holy. Then, I'm going to confess our sins, not that I speak for the collected us, but I think I might be on to something when we, I say, we are all distracted people, especially with that device that sits with us all the time. So I'm going to pray that and confess for us using our time unwisely instead of seeking the Lord. And then I'm going to thank God as a church for the missions offering. 
because we were able to provide help, relief, and we're able to send resources to people who are sharing the gospel all over the world. And we get to be a part of that. And we want to thank the Lord for that. And then S, supplication. I want to pray for anyone in the church who is sick. So would you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for who you are. Lord, thank you for your holiness. Thank you that many places in the Bible, when people speak of your holiness, they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Thank you that this doctrine tells us how beautiful, how pure, how awesome, how set apart you are. It's what makes you God. And so we thank you for your holiness. Thank you that you are calling us to be holy like you. Lord, forgive us when we're distracted, when we put other things before you. Lord, forgive us because we miss those moments where we get to connect with our Heavenly Father. Please, Lord, help us not to miss those anymore. Help us to be persistent in prayer. Help us to be the people of God who love and persist in prayer. Help us to pray for our families, for ourselves, for our communities. Well, we thank you, Lord, for the missions offer. We thank you that you provided, like the scriptures say, according to the riches of your glory, above all that we can ask or think, Lord. You doubled what we thought we could send this year. Thank you, Lord, that people are being helped. We're able to help fund church buildings. We're able to keep people on the missions feel longer. We're able to help with relief for people who have gone through disaster. So thank you, Lord, for using this church on the corner for that. Thank you for counting us worthy to be a part of that work. And Lord, for anyone in the, sit, in the church who is sick, I pray that you would help them. We pray from everyone who has a cold, and is just not feeling well, we pray that they would be made well by you, that you would help them so they can go to work on Monday or Tuesday feeling great, back to be productive and helpful where you have placed them. And for anyone who's dealing with long-term sickness, I think of people who are dealing with maybe diabetes or cancer or something like that, Lord, we ask ultimately that you would make them well but that in this season that you would help and give them the strength for whatever they need and are going through. I pray, Lord, that you would comfort them most of all in their time of need. And so we do ask for healing, but we also pray the prayer of Jesus, not our will, your will be done. We lay all this before you, Lord, because you're a God who hears us and you have called us to be a praying people. We thank you for this time and would you help us through Christ's strength, to bring glory wherever we are. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.